Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fan Sports Varsity. I'm your host, Frank Langella, joined by my co-host, Marcelio Langella. And Mars is our Week 5 Class B, C and D, and the Independent League show. Um, we're going to talk about the games going for Week 5, and uh, I think we've got two weeks left, Mars. Week 5 and Week 6, and football's done. Yeah, man, I mean, it's it's kind of flying by, and, and I, I keep mentioning this every week. Yeah, I know that some teams might not be able to play, but just be lucky that you can get on the field. And that's kind of the most important thing about the season, this COVID season, is just get as many games as possible and just let's just play some football. Absolutely. And uh, I want to welcome our fans. We appreciate you guys joining the show. And obviously, if you're new, make sure you guys follow us on, on Twitter, on Instagram. You can see on the banners. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe uh, to the channel. Give a thumbs up on the video and obviously give feedback. We always appreciate that, Mars. But let's dive through the slate of games. Let's get into it, Mars. We're going to go over six total games out of the slate of all these classes. There's even some playoff football going on in the independent league, so we'll talk about that too. Let's talk about the slate, Mars. Hen Hunt at Putt Valley. Nanuet at Pearl River. That's a big rivalry right there. Hal Dane at Rhineck. Now Hal at Woodlands in the independent league. Briarcliff at Irvington. Edgemont at Hastings. Bronxville at Brian Book. Brook. Peekskill at Mount Vernon, Ramapo at Austin, Tuckahoe at Dobbs Ferry, Byram Hills at Ardsley, Westlake at Pleasantville, and Croton Harmon at Albertus Magnus. Um, and uh, so we got a full slate of games, Mars. And we'll start off on the first one. And we're going to go stick with the B uh, schools. And we're going to go Nanuet 1 and 3 at Pearl River, who's 0 and 2. This is a big time robbery, Mars. They call this the Little Brown Jug game. Uh, between these two teams. And uh, I got to say, historically, Nanuet has owned this series. They're 14-3 and three in a little brown jug game. They've won two straight, including a win in 2019. And when you look at Nanuet, they lost to Ardsley last week. Pro River has been on pause the last couple of weeks. So they have, uh, they're, they've been dying to play football, and they're coming back in one of their biggest games, which is this rivalry. And let's start with Nanuet, Mars. Offensively, you know, by now, we know how the offense works, right? They want to try to run the football. If they can't get the running game going, they kind of get into a bit of a rut offensively. Um, but they like to uh, run behind this physical offensive line, guys like Azima, Erzy, Knapp, uh, and run with physicality at their running back spot. So I do think that against Pearl River, it's not going to be the same thickness and size that Nanuet saw against Ardsley, but they do have an athletic uh, front. And they have some toughness at the linebacker's spot. So it won't be easy just to run the football down on them uh, against Pearl River. But I do think that they have a size advantage. So I do think they'll test it. I think they're going to try to get physical with Ryan and Nicolucci behind the size of this front. But they have to find a way to get more out of this passing game, Ars. They have to find a way to make some plays out of the passing game. It was a real struggle against Ardsley. Um, it's kind of been on and off all season long. Uh, they really need to find uh, some consistency, and some of that might be just taking some 50-50 shots with one of their better athletes in DeAndre Edwards, who had a nice article on Lowood, by the way, which I read today. Um, this kid's 6'5", he runs at 4'5", 40. I, I, you know, like, there's, you're going to have to make some big chunk plays to try to win this game, and I think Daniel has got to test it in the air a little bit to try to complement their power running game. Uh, defensively, Mars, I think the secondary really is going to be tested. Uh, I think they have the size and strength at the D-line and linebacker spot to really bottle up the run in between the tackles. I thought defensive lineman Azima had a really, really good game against ours. He was very active. He made plays in the backfield. He made plays towards the sideline to show his hustle plays. Um, but I really like the toughness of the Nanuet defense. We, this is the strength of their team, their defense. Um, but can they match up against this pro rever pass attack, Mars? Uh, the way you can help your secondary is obviously to get some pressure on the quarterback, and that's winning up front. Uh, Mars, what are your thoughts on Nanuet? Anyway? Yeah, when you when you look at their offense, I mean, it's it's really going to depend on, in my opinion, the X factor is going to be the pass. And I think that when you look at Nanuet, anyway, if they can't run the ball, they really have struggled moving down the field. So I think that if you can open up the pass a little bit more, it allows for the offense to be able to be more dynamic. It forces Pro River to now have to, you know, gamble on what you're going to do. And uh, but right now, when you're skiing against Nanuet, you're like, well, they're going to be their run team, and you can see this by by looking at their front. They have a is good, a, a strong, sizable front, and it'd be smart to try to get some some yardage out of that. But the problem, as you mentioned, is that what what happens if they don't 
if they can't move, then yeah. what? Like, what are you going to do? And I think that has to has to be with a short, efficient passes. Make them have to kind of be be honest with the pass. Um, and then defensively, like like you mentioned, the front the front seven has been pretty solid. It's really going to be about the secondary. Can they perform uh, to the level of re- really uh, not not shut down secondary, but can they can they cause some 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 pressure yeah. to this Pro River offense? Yeah, and it's a great segue, Mars, looking to Pearl River offensively. You know, I thought before they went on pause, I thought the pass attack was really starting to come together with their quarterback, O'Neal, who was improving, and they have some nice playmakers on the outside who can make some plays, and specifically wide receiver Donahue was really uh, making some plays the first couple weeks. They obviously went on uh, pause. Um, They obviously, you know, they're going to go into some spread looks. They're going to try to run under center, but it's going to be tough running in between the tackles against this front, like I talked about, but... I could see them trying to test the edge of this defense, running off tackle, running towards this D-gap, um, doing outside runs, quick throw, uh, the quick passing game to kind of act like a run game and get those four to five yards. Um, I think that's going to be their best bet offensively, Mars, because uh, it's not going to be. It's going to be a grinded out game if they try to run the ball. And I think they have advantage if they try to throw it a little bit more. Uh, but they do have to keep it a little bit balanced. And so I do think if they run it, they will test inside a little bit, but most of it's going to be try to be outside. Uh, defensively, Mars, uh, you talked about, you know, when you play Manuet, you got to stop the run, right? So that's going to be the big focus. I do think the front seven is the strength of the Pro River defense, and it's with their athleticism. They have some big guys, but the, the reliance is on their speed and athleticism. Um, and, and if they get uh, create some negative plays, create some penetration uh, against the size of this front and put them in second and third and long and force Manuet to be in passing situations more often than not, I think Pro River is going to have a good chance, Marsh. What are your thoughts on Pro River? Yeah, I mean, Pro River, as you mentioned, the pass has been pretty efficient. I mean, O'Neal w- was playing pretty well before they were on pause for uh, f- for some time, but uh, I really like the way that they are, have been efficient with their throws. And I think that they, they have a, a very dynamic type of offense where they can hit you on some passes as well as run, especially when it comes to speed. I think they have a athleticism to get to the outside, and I think they're going to try that against Danuet. I think that we we already know that the defense in Danuet is really relying on their front seven. I think that they have a good way of stopping anything to the inside, but the question is going to be, can they contain? Can they stop anything outside? And, and really, can their secondary really step up? Um, and when it comes to, to Pearl River's defense, they you know they have to honestly stop the run. I mean, that, that's what we already said. That's what Nanuet's scheme is, is yeah. run first. And if you can force them to have negative plays in the beginning, then it's going to force them to do something that they don't want to do, which is pass the ball. Yeah. No, that's a great point. And for me, Mars, the matchup, I'm looking at this Nanuet offensive line versus this Pearl River defensive front. I mean, that's going to be the big dictator. Right? It's strength versus strength. Um, and we're going to see whose strength is going to come out on top. And this little brown jug game, this big rivalry. Uh, Mars, let's go to the Independent League. Mars, playoff football. How about that? We got Peak Skill 2-2 two two at Mount Vernon, who's 2-1. Uh, the Independent League is cut into two different uh, leagues. And this league, they're doing their playoffs. So this is the semifinals. Uh, you know, winner goes to the finals for this playoff seed or playoff spot. Uh, Peak Skill lost to Mount Vernon in Week 2, Mars, 24-8. Um, this is the rematch. And uh, Jay Tinsley, who's their Peak Skill star, didn't play much. Uh, against Mount Vernon. So obviously that is going to be big. Uh, he's back. So that's going to be a big uh, a big boost for Peekskill that he wasn't there for week uh, two. But let's start with Peekskill, Mars. Offensively, it's the Tinsley show. Rushing the ball, receiving the ball. Over the last two weeks, he's had over 400 yards of total offense, Mars. I mean, that's, just, <laughs> that's ridiculous. It's Madden-type numbers. So I'm expecting to see a heavy dose of Tinsley running the ball outside, receiving the ball in space because he's a home run hitter and he uh, – he can really carry an offense. But I do like that they can do change it up a little bit. They can bring in Cousins, who can run with a little bit more power um, than Tinsley. And so that, that's a nice little mixture right there. But, you know, look for with Tinsley back for them to open things up. And not just for this offense, but for that quarterback, Ritter, who, you know, when he when Tinsley wasn't playing, uh, the defense really focuses on him and, and made life really difficult for him in the first time they played. So, you know, Ritter's a guy who can really hurt you with his legs. He can make some throws. Uh, I know Throng was a little bit... Uh, wasn't as strong last week, but this is a dual threat guy, and I think this can open an opportunity for him to have a breakout game, Mars. Uh, defensively, again, you know, they have to tackle better than when they played Mount Vernon last time, Mars. They didn't do a great job tackling, and they didn't do a good job stopping Bennett, who absolutely killed them running the ball. So to me, this defensive line is going up against an offensive line in Mount Vernon that has some size, but they're going to have to try to create some penetration and really stop the you know stop them from breaking contain stopping these speedy backs from getting to the second level 
Because once they do, that's where Mount Vernon can really hurt you because these guys can hit some long plays, Mars, with their speed. Uh, what's your thought on Peak Skill? When I look at Peak Skill, I really like the way the team's been playing. And, you know, they, they ha- offensively, they can they have a lot of dynamic, like, dynamic players, right? They can kind of hit you in a lot of different spots, a lot of playmakers on this team. And I really like the way that you, guys, you look at guys like Tinsley, guys like Cousins, Ritter. They're all guys you can kind of point to as yeah. being, you know, a key piece of, the, of this offense. And then the fact that they're all going to be on back on the, on the field at the same time is going to be really important for this offense to move forward. And I think that the ability to not only attack the outside, pass to the outside, and also run with some power – does give them a pretty a pretty sizable advantage when it comes to what they're coming at, coming after you on the offensive side. Defensively, I, I like you kind of mentioned, you have to be more efficient. You need yeah. to make tackles. You need to rally to the ball. Having multiple hats to the football is definitely going to help them when it comes to kind of stopping these playmakers from Mount Vernon. Like I mentioned, once they get to the second level, it's going to be hard to stop them. So yeah. you need to stop them at the first level and really set the edge. For the, on this against this offense, yeah, absolutely. And going to Mount Vernon's offense, March week two, I thought Mount Vernon's offensive line really won the battle up front. Um, they like to spread you out. They like to create some space for their playmakers. And they're running back Jalen Bennett. He in week two, March he rushed for two hundred and thirty three yards and two touchdowns. He was absolutely killer for them. So you know Mount Vernon is going to want to create that space again, win up front, and get these guys at the second level because Mount Vernon can hit some big chunk plays. I think the formula is going to be very similar, right? Two teams with good speed, but Mount Vernon believes that their speed in open field will win. Um, and that's what they're going to try to do. But they, it all starts up front with them because they have some good size up front. And they're going to try to push people around. Defensively, Mars, you, you didn't really play Tinsley week two. You're going to have to stop Tinsley now. Uh, Tinsley is definitely going to be someone they rely heavily on, running the ball, catching the ball. The big thing to me is these edge defenders. If they can you know, tackle in space, number one and number two, Try to prevent as many outside runs as you can. Force them to run in between the tackles where you have equal size, right? So that's what you're going to want. But I'm looking at these linebackers. These linebackers are going to have to be very active. They're going to have to tackle well in space to tackle guys like Tinsley, Cousins, and Ritter. So these Mount Vernon linebackers are going to have a, a, a big day for them. Um, and if they're going to have a chance to win, they're going to have to be pretty efficient, Mars. What are your thoughts on Mount Vernon? Yeah, Mount Vernon's offensive line is really what's impressed me. I mean, they they were moving moving bodies, and they were really creating a lot of holes for their backs. And, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, we kind of mentioned the fact that these backs are so athletic that if you give them the ability to get to the second level, they're going to they're gonna make you pay. And, yeah. and the offensive line has, has a lot to do with that. Yeah. I really like the way that they, they just kind of are working, and uh, it, uh, there's a lot of smoothness to the way they play, and they really just – opening up these massive holes for their backs. And I think that that's going to be crucial for this game as well. I mean, it's going to have to be one up front. Defensively, you can kind of say the same thing. I mean, the front seven is definitely going to be the X factor of this game. They need to contain Tinsley. They need to set the edge. And they need to force everything to to their strength, which is the, the interior. Um, and I think that if they could do that, it's going to definitely set up their offense to get back on the field and try to make more plays. Absolutely. In the matchup, I'm looking at Tinsley of Pisa, who's been putting up a ridiculous number versus the linebackers, like I talked about, of Mount Vernon. I think that's going to be a really interesting matchup. Um, we're going to see who comes out on top. All right, so let's stick with the independent league. Let's go to the other playoff game, the other semifinals. Ramapo 2-2 two two at Ossining, who's 2-1. And, and Ramapo... Uh, Last week beat Poughkeepsie, the playing game, to get into this. Austin did not have a game uh, due to COVID concern, I believe. Um, but Ramapo beat Austin in Week 2. Mars is another rematch from uh, earlier in the season, Week 2. They beat him 20-8. Uh, to eight. And when you look at Ramapo offensively, Week 2, uh, what really hurt Austin and what really helped Ramapo was their pass attack. I thought Richie Lewis, he had three touchdown passes. He was getting the ball out to different receivers. Three different receivers caught a touchdown. Um, and the defense played strong. And so I'm looking at Richie Lewis last week. Uh, passing was a little bit of a struggle, right? Two for eight, one touchdown, one interception. Couldn't really get anything going, but he was hurting uh, Poughkeepsie with his feet, right? 14 carries, 92 yards, two touchdowns. This is a dual threat guy who they rely a lot on to make this offense go. And he's going to have to be huge in this game like he was in week two. Um, but, you know, he, he does have some weapons on the outside. So I do think they're going to test this secondary again. Xavier Granny had a touchdown reception. We're going to talk about a guy like Perez. He had a touchdown in two straight games. Sanchez, another guy. So, I think it's going to be tough up front because Austin does have good size up front. But I do think Ramapo has a, a speed advantage, Mars. And they're going to try to take advantage of that speed. And that's getting in space, through getting the ball out of the quarterback's hands and using the quarterback as a runner. Uh, defensively, Mars, you got to stop uh, you got to stop the, the run game against Austin and, and force Austin to be more of a passing football team. Uh, you know, Austin has uh, a lot of size up front that can push you around, but you got to rally. That's going to be the big thing for Ramapo. And sometimes you don't see that enough is that a lot of defenders rallying to the football, making sure that, you know, 
they uh, keep contained. You know, so that's going to be big. Um, so I'm looking at this defensive line. I'm looking at linebacker Jolly Cure, who I was a big fan of, and I, I think he's a really good uh, one of their more active defenders. You know, they're going to have to be huge. Uh, you know, get these guys trying to throw the ball because your defensive back gains uh, that I mentioned on offense. He has multiple INTs this year, so he's made some a few plays. Perez. He had an INT last game. So you have speed in the secondary that if you can get them passing the ball, you can force some turnovers. Mars, what are your thoughts on Rampo? Yeah, I mean, look at Rampo. One thing I definitely think of is that speed kills. And they they have so many athletes that are just – Proven that they are top notch speed in the independent league. And I really like the way this passing offense has been. Now, Richie Lewis, as you mentioned, did struggle last week with passing, but the fact that he can do both, like yeah. run and pass, definitely makes the offense more dynamic and more dangerous than uh, than what you would want to see if you're an opposing defense. Um, but you look at the defense, it's really going to have to be about stopping the run. I mean, Austin it would rather not pass. Mm-hmm. So, in my opinion, you would want to force them to do that. You want them to do something that they don't normally want to do. So, my my suggestion would be to win the early downs, force him to be in a third and long scenario and say, hey, we have the speed to stop you. We can set the edge. We can, you know, we, we have we can match you in any any sort of outside play. It really, it's going to have to be about stopping the run and just forcing them to do something that they just would rather not. Yeah. When I look at Austin, Marshall, offensively, you know, rely on your size and strength. That They have some big boys up front, um, and I think they're going to really rely on the run game to try to push Ramapo around. And it's led by their running back, Terrell Francis Mars. Last time he played, he had 23 carries, 145 yards. He also had two receptions for two touchdowns. This It was a really coming out party for Francis, and I, I think they're going to go rely right back on him. I think they're going to ride this run game uh, because, you know, Ramapo has shown that they are susceptible to runs, especially outside runs, um, in some games. So I think they're going to try to push Ramapo around. I think they're going to try to run it right down their throat and, <laughs> and be in manageable situations if they try to throw. And if they are going to try to throw, get the quarterback on the edge. He'll give them a run pass option. I think that's going to be the best case for Austin. Defensively, Mars, I haven't talked about it. They got hurt last time they played Ramapo in the passing game. They gave up big touchdowns, three of them. Uh, so to me, Austin, you have to try to limit – uh, these big pass plays to to these speedy weapons that they have. And the biggest thing to me is not just matching up defensively in the passing game, but they have to prevent Richie Lewis from uh, escaping the pocket, Mars. He's a very dangerous runner. He makes a lot of plays with his legs. you got to keep him in the pocket because he can have those back-breaking third down and you know run for first down type plays that extend drives that really are back-breaking for a defense and hurt your momentum. So to me, keep him in the tackle box. Keep Rampo's run plays in the tackle box. And you got to try to play better coverage than you did uh, in in week two. So that's going to be my big thing for Austin Mars. What are your thoughts on Austin? I mean, they have they have the size advantage, and I think that's kind of the big thing that you're focusing on, especially in the offense. It has to be uh, one at the trenches. Off, uh, front front line needs to really make a push, give the backs some room to, to some room to work, and really really just run downhill. I mean, I think they they like I mentioned before, they just they they have the advantage when it comes to just running downhill. I, and I kind of gave. The uh, heads up for Rampo, they like running outside. Austin, run inside, right? You, you can win that. You can win that fight. And when it comes to defensively, the same type of deal. I think it, you, you want to limit the outside plays, force everything t- everything inside, and and for everything that you are worth, stop Richie Lewis from getting to the outside. I think uh, that's going to be the biggest strategy of them all. Is really. You have to not only get a good pass rush, but you have to hit on those pass rush plays. Yeah. You have to be able to get the sacks and just force Richie Lewis and not escape the pocket. I mean, that'd be the, that'd be the most important thing, in my eyes, because I think that if Richie Lewis sees all hell breaks loose, he's just going to run. Yeah. And I think that was what's more dangerous about him is that he can just run and get a big first down. And you know, when you start when that starts happening, I mean, on a daily basis. The defense is just going to feel like yeah. you, you just can't stop them. You know? Absolutely. And the matchup I'm looking I'm looking at this Austin offensive line, Mars, versus this Ramapo defensive front seven is going to be big in this game. Uh, let's go to a CD matchup, Mars. Tuckahoe, 3-1 and one at Dobbs Ferry, who's 2-2. Two and two. And uh, this is a really, in my opinion, a really intriguing matchup and an even matchup. But Dobbs Ferry over historically has owned this, this, this matchup. Uh, nine and two versus Tuckahoe. They've won four straight. The last time they played, though, I believe it was 2017, where Dobbs Ferry won. Uh, but if you look at last week, Tuckahoe beat Ryan Eck in an impressive victory, and Dobbs Ferry beat Blindbrook in an impressive uh, victory as well. 
Um, and Mars, let's start with Tucko offensively. We know what the focal point is, right? They rely on this offensive line that has been very good all season for them. Um, and they like to run the ball with their running back, Myers, who he's had 100 plus yards in three out of the four games this year. We know he's a stud. But what has impressed me is the improvement of the quarterback in Nunziata, right? And last week, four of seven, 120 yards, two passing touchdowns. He had that long 80 yard touchdown. Um, but he also had a rushing touchdown, right? He brought another dynamic to this offense that is not just solely reliant on the run game. Uh, and, and I thought it was impressive. Um, and if they can get consistent contributors outside the run game, obviously you're going you're gonna to hand the ball to Myers, right? He's your best player. You're going to rely on this offensive line. Uh, but this offensive line is good enough to run block and pass block. So if you can get uh, contributors from other people consistently, that makes this tuck all offense even more dangerous. You know, I'm talking about guys like Gerald. We had a touchdown reception. Kalat. Cola Chico, uh, he had 46 yards and a touchdown, and in Chiavetta, so he had a touchdown as well. So you know you're talking about a bunch of guys uh, contributing, and if Tucker can get that consistently on offense, Mars, this offense could be pretty potent. Defensively, Mars, it's defending the option. We talk about this every week because we always come into an option game, but it starts with you know the big question I have is can they defend the fullback dive, right? Because I do think Dodd Ferry has a slight size advantage. Um, I, Tucko's defensive front and defensive front seven is definitely their strength. So I don't think it's a big difference, but I do think that with Dan, the way he runs, Brian Dan, uh, he runs like a like a little Mack truck. Like he runs a he runs like a mini fridge. So you know you're definitely gonna have to rally the ball to get him, and then that opens up the other plays to Harry Dan uh, at the C and D gap, like uh, McGovern. And so I'm looking at one of the you know one of their defensive players in Reichelt, their defensive end. I think this is an opportunity for him to have a big game. I'm looking at these edge defenders. Uh, they're going to have to be pretty big because I do think uh, Tucko is going to focus in on taking away that fullback dive and kind of stretching the, the Dobbs Ferry team to play towards the sideline. Um, and it's going to be huge on those edge defenders to make plays, Mars. Uh, again, when you look at this defense, Mars, they're the second defense out of all the C&D teams. You put all C&D together, they're the number two defense. They only give up 14 points a game. This defense has been pretty solid uh, for this group, Mars. What are your thoughts on Tucko? I mean, Tucko, I think when you look at the offense, it's definitely impressive because specifically when you look at guys like the offensive line and – and Myers uh, have been really impressive this entire season. And yeah. it, it, when you look at now how Anunziato is now improving as a quarterback, is definitely going to now open up what, more than what Tucko can actually do. And I think that the question is going to be, and you said this before, um, skill players. I mean, who yeah. else Who else besides the guys we mentioned are going to now step up to really help open up this offense than what we've seen so far? And I really I, – I know that Myers will step in. I know the offensive line will play okay. Uh, and Anunziato has definitely shown that he can now step up on a consistent basis to play well. But the question is going to be who else is going to be uh, showing up to this game. And when it comes to the defense, I mean, Das Ferry is a very is a, is a large team. They run the off uh, the option, so you need to be disciplined, yes. and you need to kind of force Das Ferry to kind of lose on those early downs and have them now have to really make a big play. And, uh, and Das Ferry has the capability of doing so. It's just you want to yeah. you want to basically increase the odds that your defense can make a stop because your defense is a top-notch defense. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's all going to start with limiting the big plays from the playmakers on Dots Ferry, like the dance, right? And if you could stop the dance like we've seen and other teams have done, it allows your offense to get back on the field and try to make another play. Yeah, and I, when you go to Dots Ferry, Mars, offensively, they average 31.25 points a game. Now, obviously, you can't average 0.25, but the average of all their points is 31.25, which is number two out of all the C&D teams. This is an explosive offense. Um, you know, they can grind tough yards, you know, with, with both Dan, with Brian Dan, with Harry Dan, running with power, and then they have their home run hitter, McGovern, on the outside. But they also have Soderquist, who can also run the ball. So, you know, Dobbs Ferry has different people uh, who can run the ball, and then they hit you with the play action. And I know it's been a little bit of boom or bust in the play action. They've hit huge plays on play action pass, and they've also missed on some open play action pass. So that's the part that hasn't been as consistent as they would like. But this is a pretty dynamic offense. They run the option as good as anybody. Dobbs Ferry. Um, but, you know, it also starts with the kudos on this offensive line, Lawrence, right? Because you have to, you can't be this potent of an offense without an offensive line that can block some people. And they've been solid. They have solid size up front. They run on, uh, you know, they rely on some tough uh, grittiness out of this offensive line. But they're going up against a tough, tough old front. I talked about the number two defense. is going to be a tough matchup right here. But if Dobbs Ferry can get by through the initial line of defense, right, get through that uh, first level and get to the second level, they have the playmakers that they can hit big chunk plays. Um, so Dodd Ferry, they just got to get by the initial. They just got to hold their blocks enough, get to the second level. Um, they can hit some big plays. But another thing that's hurt this offense, Mars, not too often, but has hurt in, in recent games, 
turnovers, right? They cannot turn the ball over. Uh, that's going to be big for them. If they play a clean game, I think they have a chance of putting up some points and, and moving the ball. Defensively, Mars, can't say the same uh, for their defense. Defensively, they give up 27.25 points a game, which is fifth out of the eight teams out of the C&D. It's kind of like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type defense, Mars. There are sometimes I've seen a really strong defense. They rally to the ball. They tackle well. Uh, they, they cause some issues for an offense. Um, and then I see... Then in other games, and missed tackles, give up big plays, big chunk plays, big plays in the, in the passing game, big plays on the outside. So which defense is going to show up? That's going to be my big question because you're going up against an offensive line that can push people around and a running back that if he gets into the open field, Mars, he will hit big chunk plays. So this is going to be big for Dobbs Ferry. they got to stop the run. They got to. I know that it's been improving Tucko's pass attack. But you got to say, hey, I trust in our secondary guys that they can match up with Tucko, but I cannot let Myers beat me, and I have to stop Myers. And I'm looking at, you know, some of the you – know, I'm looking at Soderquist. I'm looking at Harry Dan. I'm looking at the linebackers. You know, who is going to win this trench warfare is going to be the big question. And so, you know, I'm interested to see what what's going to give here, Mars. So what are your thoughts on Dobbs Fair? I mean, Dobbs Fair, I always liked the way that their offense was. I mean, they're very efficient. I mean, they – I mean, they score a lot of points, and they have a lot of playmakers on this team. And I, I know I've been rooting for Dos Ferry uh, for a while. And if you notice, I've been picking them in a lot of these games. And um, I, unfortunately, they've just been missing out on a lot of opportunities. I think that they have uh, a very well, they won last week. So. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, but opportunities, especially where they yeah. could be, you know, in, in games that were closer, they could have made, you know, uh, you know, bigger plays. And I feel like they. They score a lot, second highest in, in yes. points. I mean, that's great. I just think that they need to kind of be efficient. As you mentioned, that turnovers are a problem. Um, you have a, a body, a, a larger body offensive line. You need to start moving, uh, moving D line and moving fronts, and now just keep going back to what got you to this dance, right? Keep moving the ball with Dan's, with McGovern, and you can easily kind of score a lot of points. But the question is going to be defense. You know, can you stop? really the offensive line and Myers from really moving the ball. And I think that's going to be my X factor of the game is it really, is it going to be the, uh, the, the, the defense, the defensive front really holding up against this Tuckahoe offensive line and Myers. I mean, if, if, the Dallas for a defense can stop Myers from having a big game, then it gives your offense a lot more ability. I mean, like, and it's going to be a showdown. I mean, obviously you have a top defense versus top offense and that, that number probably, two number two. yeah, that's going to be like already a showdown, but the yeah. real X factor is going to be how much can Dallas for defense stop this, this dynamic offense of Tuckahoe. And yeah, I think absolutely. that that's going to be really set this tone of the game. And you know what? Yeah. I'll let you have that matchup. I think that is a great matchup. And to me, Mars, what can help Dallas Ferry too is having these long, uh, these long drives that keep their defense on the sideline, uh, their Don Ferry's defense and Tucko's offense on the sideline, I think will help them out. Let's go to B, Mars. Big time robbery here, Mars. Westlake 2 and 1 at Pleasantville, who's 2 and 2. There is no love lost between these two schools. Um, and if you look historically, Mars, Pleasantville has owned this series 10 and 3 versus Westlake, but Westlake has won the last two meetings, including. Last time they played in 2019. Uh, if you look at last week, Westlake beat Putnam Valley. Pleasantville lost a tough game to Byram Hills. Uh, and we'll start at the Westlake side, Mars. Offensively, you know, they'll throw the ball, and, and uh, especially on quarterback rollouts, to keep you honest. But we know what the main objective is of Westlake, and that is to run the football. The rush attack is very potent. It started with this offensive line that is very solid, that know how to move their feet. Not the most towering figures, but Bravo's a big, pretty big boy. But everybody else, you know, they just – they move their feet well. They're tough. Uh, they get some solid leverage on you, and they create lanes for these uh, shifty backs. And they can attack in multiple gaps, Mars. They attack the C gap, the D gap. Sometimes they can run inside. It all obviously starts with that quarterback, Sardo. He's had a touchdown in three straight games. Uh, you know, he's one of the most dynamic players in the class. But there has been other guys who have really stepped up in recent weeks. Falkenberg, he's had two touchdowns last week. He's been somebody. Lamas, I thought he's been really solid on both sides of the ball the last couple weeks. That's another guy, and then they can run some power with Piazza, who, who's who's also uh, had some couple a couple touchdowns. So this offense now, you're starting to see a cast of people step up behind a, a, a an athletic offensive line and Sardo. You know th this this offense could cause some issues, and uh, you know they're really going to run against a tough Pleasantville defense. 
But, you know, they're going to keep hammering away at you until they can get to open space and maybe hit one of those big chunk plays. Um, defensively, Mars, I think this is really the strength of this team. Uh, you know, when I talk about this defensive line, they're very explosive. Again, not the biggest guys outside of Bravo, but you talk about Bravo, Ojeda, Marto. These are guys that like to penetrate. They like to get into the backfield. They like to cause negative plays. And then you look at these linebackers in secondary. Uh, they rally to the ball. They, uh, Because this defensive line causes so much pressure on the offensive line, it allows them to roam free. It's hard for the offensive line to get to the second level. You're talking about guys like Piazza, Murray in the secondary, Lamas. They've made quite a few plays over the last few weeks, and this defense is really starting to come together. Um, but I do think Pleasantville is going to try to outmuscle it. So I do think they're going to try to run right at them. And to me, again, that could be the only weakness to this Westlake defense is can they anchor down when people run right at you? When they don't allow your speed to dictate the game. I thought they did a pretty solid job against Arsley. It's going to be another test against this Pleasantville uh, offensive line that has some good size. And another thing, they got to be wary of their wide receiver, Pleasantville McDermott. He has really made plays for, for Pleasantville these last few weeks. He has been a dynamic playmaker, home run hitter for them. Um, so the secondary has to be wary of McDermott hitting big plays. Uh, Mars, what are your thoughts on Westlake? Yeah, I mean, Westlake, you, you know their goal is to run the ball as much as, as they can. They have a lot of dy- dynamic players that, that, that can do that, and they can attack it from all different angles. I mean, at the end of the day, the key weapon is going to be Sardo. I mean, can, how much can you stop him? We, we put him as uh, one of our top-tier players of this class for a reason. He is very dynamic. He can really run the ball very well. Yes. Um, Westlake's going to have him be, I think, the key focal point of this offense. And I think that, you know, they in order for them to really – uh, be effective, in my opinion, would be to use a lot of misdirection. I think that because everyone's going to look at Sardo and the question is going to be, can other players step up and play you know, to the same level as him? Yeah. And if they can, then now it's going to cause some, some problems to the defense because they're all looking at Sardo but if somebody else makes the big play, it's going to be hard for them to kind of counteract to that. But you kind of mentioned the fact that the defense has been kind of being uh, been the pivotal uh, aspect of this team, yeah. and I think that they're very gritty. I think they play really tough, and they've always I feel like they never back down to any team they played against. I mean, no matter what size you know team it was, I mean, I think the impressive thing was playing against Arsley. I yeah. think Arsley, being uh, generally more recent years, has been a powerhouse in this class, and they kind of stepped up to him. They punked him, and I think that that's something that um, tells you a lot about the defense in general they're, they're they have a lot of hats to the ball and they're going to make you feel it right and i think that's the important thing about their defense i think you make a great point on the offensive side for westlake uh pleasantville plays with a really aggressive style defense the misdirection and the counter action that could be something that hurts uh, pleasantville but let's move to pleasantville mars offensively we know it was a struggle last week you go up against byron mills it usually is a struggle but i tell you what i thought they made some nice plays offensively they just couldn't finish drives they you know when they came to a big third down they just couldn't finish the deal. They couldn't uh, get drives to continue. Um, but I thought they, you know, they did some good things. And and the big thing is to rely on this offensive line that has good size, run the ball with May um, and other running backs right at West. I think that's going to be their best chance. If they can run at them, get ahead of the chains, and then the other stuff can come out. The outside runs, the bubble screens, uh, the play action pass, that's going to be all supplement to running downhill. And it's going to be big for these running backs to try not to dance because Westlake has too much speed. You need to get as many yards as you can. So get one cut and go. And this offensive line is going to be a big – if they're going to have a chance, this offensive line has to be the big winners of this game. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking at a guy you know, with May running behind this line and then on the outside – Try to hit some big plays to McDermott, trip to Picard. This could be a game where Picard uh, breaks out. I think this guy, you know, young, really young football player, uh, he, he could be that next type of good, really Pleasantville uh, type uh, athlete. And this could be a game that, that really makes a stand. You have to, if you want to be an all-time Pleasantville guy, you have to make big plays in these big rivalries, right? And this is one of them. Um, so that's what I think offensively. Try to get the ball to McDermott. Try to get the and Picard on the outside. And sustaining drive is going to be big. Defensively, Mars. I thought they played really tough against Byron Hills. Uh, and I thought they played tough all season. I think uh, Pleasantville's had, I think, ba- four bad quarters on defense, right? The first quarter against Hen Hood and the second half against Byron Hills. Uh, but outside of that, I thought they played really tough. But you could tell that they've worn down after uh, the last two weeks. They've worn down after a period of time. Um, and so to me, this defense really has to focus in on stopping Weiler. We talk about it. Every team that plays uh, Weiler, you have to talk about stopping Sardo. Um from getting outside runs. That's going to be big. And the next big thing, and then we talked about it with Westlake, the misdirection. You can't fall for misdirection. Make sure you stay disciplined to your reads. Don't over-pursue on any uh, counteraction uh, because that's what Westlake wants to do. They want to get into the open field because they feel they have the speed, and I think they do, to hit big chunk plays. And we've seen it a few times against Pleasantville 
uh, big chunk plays hurt this defense. So it's going to be very important to stay disciplined, Mars. Um, Pleasantville's best chance, you know, because the offense has kind of been a bit of a grind, is to try to keep this game in low scoring, right? So offensively, you want to maintain drives. Defensively, you want to, you know, force them to drive down the field. Force them to have 80-yard drives. Don't give up big chunk plays. You want this game to be 7-7 seven, seven going into the fourth quarter because that means Pleasantville, you know, they could just make one or two more plays to win this game. Uh, Mars, what are your thoughts on uh, Pleasantville? Yeah, I mean, when, we look, when you look at all the offense of Pleasantville, uh, firstly, I think that you saw a lot of movement um, against against Byram, and I think that that was something that was you know pretty big deal because of the fact that Byram's defense has been pretty lethal, especially yeah. with their front. Uh, and you kind of mentioned the fact that just they couldn't really just finish drives, and I think that that is definitely something that is a, a lost art. A lot of teams have had struggles of just finishing a drive and always coming away with points. Um, but they, I, in my opinion, I think. You you have to play aggressive against Westlake. You have to kind of, you know, run downhill. And, and as you mentioned, I think the game plan would, the best game plan would be to try to run the clock down, own the possession yes. of time, and really wear down Westlake. I yeah. mean, because at the end of the day, when you look at the size difference, I think Pleasantville has the advantage on the offensive line and defensive line in size. Yeah. And I think that if you, you're playing in, in Westlake's face, you play downhill, it's going to wear down Westlake on all fronts. And I think it, that will play in your benefit because by the late third, fourth quarter, you know, you can hit a big play because by that time, they, they're going to be shot. right? And I think that's going to be the big thing on the offensive side. And defensively, you have to be really impressed with how defense is played. Uh, I mean, generally, when you look at the the score, uh, you know, the touchdowns that have been scored against these, this defense, it's never really been drives. It's always and been a place. big play that's yeah. always happened, and I think that's like that's the a testament of the defense to show that they never really been driven on to score. Yeah, it's, it's always been. I know it's a flaw <laughs> that you see like the one big play yeah. that causes a, a touchdown to happen, and and I think that as long as they play efficient against Westlake and they stop Sardo from making those big plays, then I think that this is going to be a a, a, a close game, yeah. but a showdown in, in the long run. But it, but it's not just Sardo, right? So like Falkenberg and Lamas, these are guys who can hit big plays on the outside too. So it's going to be important. And another thing too, special teams got to step up this week because they really let Pleasantville down last week, and they need to uh, try to make some plays on special teams. You can win in, in another phase that gets this game close. Um, but meet the matchup, Mars. I'm looking at this Westlake rush attack versus Pleasantville's rush defense. That's going to be a big dictator. Let's go to the game of the week, Mars. We're sticking with B. Byron Hills 4-0 at Ardsley, who's 3-1. and This is a rematch of the 2019 Class B Championship. Ardsley is 4-1 and versus Byron Hills, including two victories in 2019. I mentioned it, one of them being the championship. But if you look at last week, Byron Hills beat Pleasantville. Ardsley beat Manuet. Uh, Mars, let's start with Byron Hills. This has really become a two-headed rush attack monster with Weiler and Fruin. They really have uh, both been really good complements of each other, whether it's running with power, running outside, or running counters. Uh, they've done a pretty good job, uh, those two guys. But, you know, with this offensive line who is tough, again, not towering figures, um, but they have some pretty good size at the tackle spots, guards who can move pretty well. Um, I do think they're going up against a really strong defensive front set. Uh, thick guys, again, hartsey has got some real thickness and some strength in the front seven. So I do think, you know, they will run their basic stuff. Um, but I do think though Byron Hills wants to incorporate a little more outside stuff. I, that's where I think that they could try to hurt this RZ defense, who's a very good defense. And, um, you know, try to hit those outside runs with Wiley with Fruling. But the question to me is, can you know, Fruling in this pass attack was a little shaky last week versus Pleasantville. I want to see if they can improve, right? Because that's going to be big. If they can hit a few big pass plays um, to a guy like Weinhoff, to a guy like Franco, who, you know, was kind of uh, put into check by Pleasantville last week. If they can hit some big pass plays, that will make this offense really difficult to beat. And this is the number one offense, Mars. They average 32 points a game. They're the number one in B. So this offense got to have some nice long drives, uh, and, and they're going to have to hit some big chunk plays. And I'm thinking it's on the outside and in the passing game. Defensively, Mars, uh, I think this defensive front seven matches up pretty well with this Arsley rush attack and this offensive line. Uh, you know, when you have guys like Ratson and Carnavali at the linebacker spot, Ahern, Aben Marco. Um, I think running in between the tackles consistently won't be that, you know, it won't be that easy for Arsley to do. Um, but I do think the secondary is really going to be tested. Uh, I think that the Arsley pass attack has been improving each week, and they're going to try to throw the ball, and they're going to try to spread you out and get the ball to these weapons in space. So can this secondary match up with the skill guys that Arsley has in this pass attack? That's going to be big. And these edge guys can't let Ballard get outside. Mars, what are your thoughts on Byron Hills and this 
revenge tour. Yeah, I mean, when you look at uh, Byron Hills, uh, as you mentioned, I, I really look at Weiler as being a, a key pivotal point. I was a fueling as well. I think they both have become very impressive in how athletic they are and how what multiple things they can do. I, I think that Weiler has become a guy that has proven himself to be, you know, I, I kind of compare him to, to like the Kaiser of B, right? I think that he is kind of that force that a lot of people are like, well, we have to key in on him because yeah. he can kind of do it in, in multiple different ways. I think that, uh, you know, Kaiser has more of a speed aspect to him more than what Weiler can do. But I think that Weiler is very dangerous. I think yes. he can run downhill. He can run outside. He can kind of do a lot of different things. And I think that when you look at what Byron Hills is going to do is try to, like you mentioned, you know, try to play some more outside. Yeah. Try to try to get out of the box because of the fact that Arsley's front is pretty big and pretty pretty strong. So I think offensively, that's they're going to be the game plan. Defensively, I think that it's going to. I mean, they match up right. The front seven matches up pretty well. Yeah. And I really, it's going to have to depend on how well this is a secondary play. If they can play thorough, like well enough, efficient enough, where it you know it stops those big plays, especially from the pass. Then I think the front front seven is going to stay stay down pat. Yeah, and when I go to Arsley Mars offensively again, we talk about they have a good strong offensive line that moves their feet well, and they actually do a pretty good job pass protection as well. And they're going to have to play big against this Byron Hills front uh, and the pass rush. Um, the running running the ball hasn't been as consistent as you wanted it to be, but they do have a nice mix with Labaris and Phelan. Uh, both guys have made a lot of plays for them in the run game, um, but this pass attack is where really this offense has been lethal. Uh, when you talk about quarterback for large March, they had another three touchdowns last week, uh, thrown a, uh, to wide receiver Jones, who had two tu- two receiving touchdowns. He's had three the last two weeks. Uh, when you talk about, we obviously know Watson. Watson's a dynamic playmaker, going up at tight end and out wide. And then you talk about Peterson, another guy. So they're really going to, I think they're going to test the secondary Byron Hills, and they should. I think that's where their advantage is going to come from uh, going up uh, for their offense versus that defense. Defensively, Marsh, we're talking about the number one defense in B. So this is another classic number one offense versus the number one defense. Um, they're really the number two defense at all in section one in points allowed, Marsh. So this is a very talented defense. They're number two in all section one, number one in B for a reason. Uh, they only give up about 5.25 points a game. They're absolutely stout in the front seven. They're really hard to move. Uh, they have really solid, active linebacker play. And even the secondary rallies pretty well and plays the pass. Um, but, again, I think Byron Hill's going to try to test the outside of these guys. I think they're going to try to run with Weiler, run with Frueling. Uh, once they get to the outside, they'll run with power and try to bulldoze these, these DBs. Um, but they want to use their speed to get it through the initial line of defense, Mars. Um, what are your, you know, stopping Weiler is a four-quarter matchup. So you can have a good first half, but he can hit off a big play at any point. So it's going to be four quarters fighting, and uh, I think Arsley is going to have uh, – they're playful, but I do think they have the talent to do it. Uh, what are your thoughts on Arsley, Mark? Yeah, when you look at Arsley, I mean, my opinion is try to hit some of these outside plays. Try to test the secondary of Byron Hills. I think that you have the advantage when it comes to making those uh, – trying to pass it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, defensively, I think, as you mentioned, it's going to have to be stopping Wilder, and it's, it's, it's going to be a boxing match, like yes. a 15-round boxing match against Wilder because he's going to ground and pound. He's going to try to hit you on the outside, and you have to just stay down pat. Set the edge, rally to the ball. I mean, Weiler, Weiler is a strong dude, but he can get taken down with multiple people yes. attacking him. And I think that's something that, that we saw with, with Pleasantville in the beginning of the game, but they kind of lost that edge later on. And we saw that in, in the previous games as well. You need to have multiple bodies attacking Weiler on, uh, daily. Yes, absolutely. The matchup I'm looking at is this number one offense versus the number one defense. March is obviously going to be a big matchup, and I'm going to see which one gives. And the player to watch for me, I'm looking at the quarterback and defensive back in Fruling. Um, you know, we obviously know he's had a really good season. He's made a lot of plays with his legs. He's made some plays with his arm. He's even made plays defensively. He has a few interceptions, including the pick six. Uh, but can he make plays in the passing game is going to be the big question to me. And I think if he can, that'll be a huge uh, boost for this Byron Hills offense. Uh, Mars, let's go to the game pits. Ready? Mm-hmm. I'm ready to roll. All right, let's do it, Mars. Uh, let's start at the B. Hen Hud, 2-1 and one at Putnam Valley, who's 0-4. I'm going to go first, Mars. I'm going Hen Hud. I think Hen Hud has too much speed. Uh, they have some good size up front. But once those running backs get into open space, they can cause some serious problems for a defense. And I think guys like Cepeda and Travis are going to hit some big plays. And Artope is going to hit some uh, power running plays. 
and he's going to make some plays at the linebacker spot, Mars. I think Hen Hunt wins this game. Yeah, I'm going to go with Hen Hunt as well. I think their speed is definitely the most lethal part about their team on both offense and defensive side of the ball. Um, I think Putt Valley is, is still a growing program. I also think that they still don't know necessarily what their identity is on the offensive side. And I just think that Hen Hunt has, has been steamrolling. I think that their momentum is growing, yeah. and it's just another win for them. Absolutely. Uh, let's go to a C matchup, Mars Haldane, 1 and 3 at Rynek, who's 0 and 3. I'll go first. I think Haldane's going to win this. I think the Santoses are going to contribute, both of them, in the run game, uh, and they're going to control the tempo of this game. I think defensively, uh, they have been gritty for the most part. They're four out of the eight teams out of the C and D combined. Um, I know they've had a few ugly games, but for the most part, I thought they've been pretty gritty, and I think they're going to hold this Rynek offense in check and give their offense more opportunities. I'm going Haldane. Yeah, I'm going to go Haldane as well. I feel like the Santos are mm-hmm. definitely going to come out in force, and I think they're going to have a big game here with this win for Haldane. Uh, let's stick with C. Mars Valhalla, 3-1 at Woodlands, who's 0-3. I'll go first again, Mars. I'm going to go with Valhalla. I think they really have find their identity on offense. Uh, you know, with running the ball with multiple guys, with O'Neal, with Davis, uh, with Robinson. Uh, I think they have a nice little potent uh, attack going offensively. And defensively, you know, I know they have given up some big plays. Uh, we've seen that. Obviously, watch out for K.J. Leak on Woodlands, who makes a bunch of big plays, it feels like, each week. Um, so that could be a little dangerous for Valhalla. But I got to tell you, I think Valhalla will control the tempo of this game, and I think they'll win. Yeah, I'm gonna go Valhalla as well. They just have a lot of weapons. I like the the way they've been playing recently, and I I think that they I think they just have more than what Woodlands has, and I yep. think that this is gonna be a pretty big win for Valhalla because the momentum is just gonna keep growing for them. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go to the independently Mars Briarcliff two and zero at Irvington, who's one and two. Listen, I gotta say this: I think Irvington is really tough defensively. I think they have a really nice front seven, put a lot of pressure on your offense. But I just don't think they can generate enough offense to match Briarcliff. And I'm going to go with Briarcliff. Briarcliff, I believe, is the class of the independent league. They average 29 points a game. Mars, I don't think Irvington, if they can run the ball consistently, uh, can score enough points. And guys like Rispoli and Savage uh, have made big plays in the first two games for Briarcliff. And what I feel is Briarcliff's defensive front is going to make it hard to run the ball and force Irvington to make plays passing the ball, which they won't have enough of. I'm going Briarcliff. Yeah, Briarcliff, in my opinion, I think is going to win this one because of the fact their offense is just so high-powered. I think that they do have a good front. They kind of try to halt Irvington in their tracks. I just think the offense is going to outscore them. It's going to be a track meet. Um, let's stick with the independent league. Mars Edge, Mob, 1-1 one one at Hastings. That is 3-1. and one. Hastings had a tough loss uh, last week, and I'm really interested to see how these kids bounce back, see how these coaching staff gets these guys ready. Um, I really do like this Hastings team. I, I talked about it multiple weeks. Um, I think the coaching staff and players have done a really good job, but I'm actually going to go edge bomb, Mars. Um, I think the difference is going to be Rosen. They're, you know, we talk, you know, we forget about him because they missed a bunch of time during the COVID pause. It comes back. He's one of the best backs in the independent league, and if he's playing behind this front, which I think is going to be the big difference. The offensive line has some solid size to it. Um, I think they'll be able to run the ball and run the ball well against this front. And quarterback, uh, Milan Leonardo. So, uh, you know, I thought he had a pretty good game last week. And he kind of showed out. He, you know, he's starting at quarterback now. I thought he made some really nice plays. But I do think the defensive line is going to get some pressure on quarterback Kennedy. And Edgemont Mars is 7-1 and one versus Hastings over their last eight meetings. Um, so... I'm going to go with Edgemon. I think this is the upset. I'm going to go with Hastings, actually. I think that Hastings had a tough loss, but I don't think they're going to try to fall in that same spot again. I think they're going to have a big bounce back win uh, to try to set them right back on the same path that they were hoping for in the beginning of the season. And I think it's going to be a big win for Hastings. Yeah. Uh, let's stick with the independent Mars Crow and Harmon. One and three. They just had a victory today against Blindbrook at Albertus Magnus, who is three and one. And listen, I'm going to say this about Crow and Harmon. I think Leto makes he's a nice playmaker. Uh, he had a passing touchdown. He had a kick return touchdown this previous game. Um, and Greece has been all over the field. I think he had 15 tackles, Mars. So these guys, you know, Crow and Harmon has some guys. But Albertus Magnus has been one of the surprise teams of this season. Uh, they're three and one. I know they lost Larusso, which is a tough loss for them. Uh, I know that uh, like Savor, their freshman, they they rave about this guy is going to step in and try to make plays for them. Um, but I think they have a bunch of dudes. Maher, Johnson, 
And this defense the last couple of weeks, Mars, is a top three defense in the independent league. And I think that's what they're going to ride. And I think Albertus Magnus is going to win this game. Yeah, I'm going to go Albertus Magnus as, as well. I feel like their defense is going to give them the opportunities and their, and their offense is just going to capitalize on every chance they get. I think they have a lot of weapons on this team. And I just think that there's uh, I mean, it's going to be a close one, in my opinion. But I think Albertus Magnus is going to walk away the victor on this one. All right, Mars, let's go to some of the games that we covered in the B matchup. Nanuet 1-3 and three at Pearl River, who's 0-2. Who wins this big rivalry? Who wins the Brown Jug this year, Mars? I think it's going to be Pro River. I think that Pro River, when you look at this team, has a lot more ability to, especially on the offensive side, uh, can, they can do more. I, I'm not saying that Nanuet can't do it, but they also do depend on the running the ball a little too much for, for me just to say that this was going to be a little too close. I think Pro River has the advantage on that. And I think if the defense steps up and stops the run, what is Nanuet going to do? I mean, and I feel like I, I don't think that they're going to hit on those passes, and that's why I think Pro River is going to win. This has been a tough one for me. I went back and forth a bunch of times. I like Nanuet's physicality. I know that Nanuet wants to control the tempo of the game and shorten the game with their run game and play good defense. But I don't. I agree with you about this. I don't think they can make enough big plays and big chunk plays to help their offense. And I'm going to go with Pro River as well. I think Pro River gets their first win. I think they get revenge for last year. They've been itching to play. They've been on pause for the last few weeks. And we've seen a mixed bag. Uh, sometimes it's good that a team has a break, right? That, you know, they're extra motivated to play. Sometimes it's because of the reduced practice. They don't look that good. So it's going to be hard to see who comes out of this. But I think Pro River is going to pull it out. And I think they win. Uh, let's go to the playoff game in the Independent League. Mars Peak Scale 2-2 two two at Mount Vernon, who's 2-1. I'll start it up. I'm going Peak Scale, Mars. I think Tinsley not playing much against Mount Vernon. First time they play is a big loss, and he's back. And I think Peak Scale offensively is really rolling. And the big question is going to be defensively. If they can prevent big plays, Mars, I think Peak Scale is going to win this game and go to the championship in the Independent League. And that's what I think is going to happen. I'm going Peak Scale. Yeah, I'm going to go Peak Scale as well. I've been I've been a big fan of Peak Scale. I've been, I've been rooting them on this yeah. whole time. And I feel like that their offense is now clicking on all cylinders. And it's like you said, their defense is definitely going to need to step up. And I also think it's going to be a nice revenge game. I mean, they, they had a, a really tough... Uh, they've had a tough road, and they've been they've clawed their way out of it. And I think this is going to be their chance to really make that big time move up to the championship. Let's go to the other playoff game, Mars Independent Rampo two and two at Ossining, who is two and one. I'll start it off, Mars. I think it's another revenge game. I'm going Ossining. Uh, I think the big difference is going to be defense, and I think Ossining's defense is going to make enough plays to stop this Richie Lewis from getting outside and to stop this pass attack. And I do think that they are going to control this game. Uh, with the defense and with them, their ability to run the ball and run with power up front. I think they'll control the ball. I think they'll uh, run with their running backs, including their quarterback. And I do think Austin is going to win this and go to the championship. I have Austin. I'm going to go Rampo. I think this is going to be a, a big game for Richie Lewis. I think he has the ability to really make a lot of plays, um, whether it's him running the ball or pass the ball. And I think he's going to get outside. I think Austin is going to be unable to stop him from doing the one thing they need to stop from doing, which is run the ball. Yeah. Um, and I think he's going to make a lot of plays on his legs. And I think they're going to they're going to get out of this close game and win. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the CD match at Mars Tucko. 3-1 at Dobbs Ferry, who is 2-2. Two and two. This one was another really tough tough one for me. I went back and forth a bunch of times. I'm going to go Dobbs Ferry. I think Dobbs Ferry wins, and I think it's because they're going to control this game offensively against a very tough defense. Dobbs Ferry defense does make me nervous, Mars. I'm not going to lie. Um, but if they can run the ball and keep Tuckahoe's offense on the sideline, I think Dobbs Ferry will make enough big chunk plays uh, that they're going to win this game. But I do think it's going to be a close one. Um I hope the defense shows up, but I'm going Dobbs Ferry. It's going to be tough. Um, and I've been kind of in the middle about this one just because you look at Tuckahoe, they have a, a, a I like good, Tucko. They have good defense. Good, yeah. they, have, they have a good offense um, behind behind Myers. Uh, I just I think I'm going to pick Dos Ferry, um, and you know I've been I've been picking Dos Ferry quite a lot this year, <laughs> um, and the, the 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 reason why I'm picking them is because I like the way their offense plays. They have a lot of weapons on offense. They have the Dans. I like the way they play. They have McGovern, who's been playing really well, um, and I just think this is going to be kind of a, an outscoring match. See who can outscore the other. I think Dos Ferry is going to kind of be the one that outscores Tuckahoe, and I think they're going to walk away this win. Let's go to another big rivalry. Well, you're not going to pick this one. I will. Westlake two and one at Pleasantville two and two. Doesn't Pleasantville call them the the team in Thornwood? Yeah, right, they don't even name them. But I'll pick this one. You could stay on the sideline. I'm going to go Westlake Mars. I think Westlake wins this big rivalry, and it's just uh, I think the defense is really humming for Westlake, and I think it's going to make it tough for Pleasantville to have these long drives. And if it gets to a 
bit of a high scoring matchup. I don't think Pleasantville has enough weapons to match Westlake. But the big question to me is going to be these fronts. Uh, because Pleasantville has a really good size up front, um, it wouldn't surprise me if it's a low scoring game going into the fourth quarter. I just think Westlake has a little too much firepower on the offense um, that they're going to pull it away. Because I like both these defenses, but I'm going to go Westlake. All right, March, the game of the week. The rematch of the B Championship in 2019. Byron Hills 4-0 at Ardsley 3-1. Does Arsley continue its dominance, or does Byram Hills get revenge, Mars? Well, who wins and why? Well, when you look at Byram Hills, right, they have um, a, a very large front. I mean, Weiler has been showing out as a beast this whole time. Fruling has been another really important weapon for Byram Hills, and I, it's they've been clicking on all cylinders. I really think they have been really offensively scoring a lot of points, yeah. defensively stopping teams from scoring a lot. Um, and I think that it's just been working out really well. Ardsley, on the other hand, has had a tough loss. I mean, looking at the Westlake game was definitely a shocker for a lot of teams. And uh, it, it was a, definitely a big upset. And they, more recent years, they've been dominating really the, the class uh, in general. And I think that when you look at this offense, they, you know, they, they've been moving bodies. And I think that they have the uh, skill players to do so. And they have the, the scheme that can do multiple different things. Yeah. But that all that being said, I'm going to pick Ardsley. I think Ardsley is going to come away the victor on this. And I, the reason why I think so is because I think that Ardsley is going to now focus on hitting a lot of these outside plays. I mean, when you watch Byron Hills against, against Pleasantville, I mean, you saw that Pleasantville could move the ball. And granted, I don't think Pleasantville's offense is on, is on the same strength side as Ardsley's is. And they were able to kind of move the ball in Byron Hills. Now, granted, they weren't able to capitalize on some of the big plays, but it showed that they have the ability to move on this defense. And I think Ardsley is going to now have not only move on this on this defense, but capitalize on those big plays. And I think that they're going to stop Weiler from getting to the outside and really force him to go into their strength, which is their front. And I think Byron Hills might get stunned a little bit. I mean, you saw in the first half of last week, where it was a battle, right? First half of the game yeah. against Pleasantville, it was a battle. I mean, granted, it pulled away for sure. I mean, with big special teams plays, yeah. but if you would take away the special teams, I mean, it was a, it was a fight between offense and defense, and I think that Ardsley is going to have a little bit more oomph, and they're going to really stop Byron from winning this game. Listen, you make a lot of good points. Ardsley has the number one defense in the class. Uh, their offense, you know, has been really been improving in the passing game. But I do think the revenge is going to be served in this matchup, and I think Byron Mills is going to win. I just feel like this is kind of destiny for this Byron Mills team. They have talent at every level on both the offense and defensive side of the ball, and they have to remember the beating that they took in 2019 uh, from this Arsley team. Let's just call it what it was. It was a beat in the championship. So I think there's going to be a little extra motivation. Um, I do think they have a little bit more of a veteran presence, and I do think Fruling is going to have a breakout game. I know the focus is going to be Weiler, and Weiler is going to have a solid game, but I do think Fruling and Franco might be the guys who be the X Factor in this one. I think Byron Mills wins. All right, everyone, that was our show. We appreciate everyone tuning in. I hope you guys have a safe and sports-filled weekend, and we'll see you all very soon.